Um, so thank you very much to the organizers, uh, Prof. Uh, David Lai, as well as the scientific chair, uh, Prof. Uh, Paul Tambayer, for giving me this opportunity uh, to share what we have been doing. So we've just heard from Prof. Guy Thwaites about the role of steroids. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you right up front that steroids are not everything in TB. Uh, so, and I'm going to introduce some key concepts uh, with the hope of trying to further improve clinical care uh, in our TB patients. Uh, these are my, my disclosures. Uh, I'm going to first introduce uh, the importance of neutrophils in host pathogen interactions in TB. Uh, and then uh, show you some work that we have been doing on diabetes and TB. And, and those of us who treat TB do know that diabetes actually worsened the immunopathology in TB. We're trying to get some glimpse of to why that happens. Uh, and I'm going to give you some uh, data with regards to uh, what we've been doing for CNS-TB uh, and uh, with some data that we have now uh, shown in a phase two trial uh, about potential host directed therapy within TB patients themselves. So uh, neutrophils are, have been, uh, as we know, uh, have, have been pretty much underplayed in the role of, of TB. We've, we've been taught in, uh, in our bi biology days that TB typically it's macrophage and dendritic cells, antigen presenting cells. Uh, but neutrophils uh, have now uh, uh, played a more prominent role. Uh, we have uh, increasing evidence that they differentiate uh, active TB from other infectious diseases. Uh, and and they, that drives uh, TB transcription signature. Uh, MTB also uh, uh, infection uh, also exploits neutrophil uh, inflammation uh, and it causes more tissue damage. And severe TB itself in humans is associated with neutrophil abundance. Uh, as you can see from our full blood count from our TB patients, quite often you, uh, than not, you do see some uh, predominant uh, neutrophil, uh, neutrophilia over there. So I'd like to introduce the concept of a matrix degrading phenotype, and that's predominantly uh, driven by uh, host uh, human matrix proteinases. What are MMPs? They are proteases that degrade um, all extracellular matrix at a neutral pH, and they're involved in key immunological and pathological roles in TB. So what happens in the matrix degrading phenotype is whereupon the activity of these host MMPs are unopposed by the endogenous tissue inhibitors of uh, metalloproteinases or TIMPs as we call them for short. Uh, MMPs uh, have been shown by Lali Ramakrishnan's group to be involved in mycobacteria granuloma formation in the zebrafish model. Uh, and uh, previously, my colleagues have shown that MMP1 per se does, does drive tissue destruction in human pulmonary TB. Uh, themselves, and that's using both the human uh, samples as well as in uh, uh, mice which are knocked in for MMP1, which displayed increased tissue destruction. Uh, and, and what happens within uh, the pathophysiology of TB infection itself, it's that on infection, there are mononuclear and neutrophil recruitment, uh, and subsequently the formation of the caseous uh, necrotizing granulomas itself. And this granuloma actually sits on the buttress of a stable extracellular matrix. Um, and uh, for reasons such as immunosuppression uh, or uh, other, visa, other endogenous reasons, uh, there are increase in MMP activity leading to matrix uh, degradation of the extracellular matrix. Uh, and then you, that, that leads to the release of matrix degradation products such as P3NP and uh, desmosine, uh, and also the erosion of the granuloma into the bronchus and further dissemination of MTB. Uh, and uh, so for some of you who may not be aware, the extracellular matrix that are, that are important within the lung itself uh, are uh, collagen, uh, gelatin, and, and also elastin, which, which provides the elasticity when we inhale and exhale. So uh, previously we've shown that uh, MTB in neutrophils do degrade uh, type 1 collagen, which is the main structural matrix in the human lung. Uh, and in vitro, this you can see this is a, a confocal microscopy. And what we've done was to infect uh, uh, neutrophils with uh, MTB live in the BSL tree. Uh, we can see that that's MTB itself. And the superimposed image, uh, we showed that the, um, the collagen breakdown, which gives of, uh, fluorescence uh, is shown over in the merged image. So doxycycline is a uh, US FDA approved uh, MMP inhibitor uh, for uh, gum diseases or periodontitis. Um, you could see in this uh, uh, 
quantitative fluorescent assay uh, that TB infection of uh, neutrophils itself upregulates collagenase activity, but uh, with an increasing concentration of doxycycline itself, the collagenase activity actually uh, is significantly inhibited. So what happens in TB patients? So these are, uh, this is a study that was done in collaboration uh, with our colleagues over in Peru, uh, and they have recruited 108 uh, TB patients uh, together with their household contacts. Uh, these, uh, you could see, is the uh, MMP uh, profile in their household contacts, and you could see that in TB patients themselves, uh, the MMP within the sputum is upregulated. Uh, particularly high are uh, MMP 8 and 9, and the question was where these MMP 8 and 9 uh, is derived from. So I have uh, uh, then profiled the neutrophil markers. Uh, we know that myeloperoxidase as well as neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin uh, are uh, uh, quite robust neutrophil markers. Uh, and we have shown that uh, in within TB patients themselves, uh, these uh, neutrophil markers are also increased. Uh, and to cut the long story short, there was a very strong correlation between myeloperoxidase and neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin with MMP8 and 9, indicating that these MMP8 and 9 might be principally neutrophil derived. Um, then moving on to functional assays, uh, within the TB patients itself, the collagenase activity uh, is increased compared to their household uh, context uh, sputum. Uh, this is the same collagenase assay, whereupon the uh, destruction of collagen gives off fluorescence. You've seen the sputum itself degrading the uh, type 1 collagen. Uh, any of you use a MMP8 neutralizing antibody, uh, it neutralizes and significantly decreases the uh, type 1 collagenase activity. Uh, the MMP8 uh, 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 concentrations also strongly correlate with the type 1 collagenase activity. Uh, and this uh, indicates that the neutrophils which secrete the MMP8 uh, can potentially be the source of the collagenase activity that you see uh, within the respiratory compartment of the pulmonary TB patients. Uh, we then managed to collaborate with a pathologist, uh, and these are human lung biopsy specimens from pulmonary TB patients. You can see the lice, uh, the nice uh, cavity over there with uh, cages. Uh, necrosis, if you, and if you could zoom in uh, at the wall of the cavity itself, these are actually apoptotic uh, neutrophils. Uh, we've stained then the um, for neutrophil elastase, and interestingly, the whole cavity around the circumference uh, is positive for neutrophil elastase, uh, and the uh, neutrophils itself stain positive for MMP8. Uh, the casium itself is also positive for MMP8 and MMP9 uh, as well. So for the first part of my talk, uh, what I've shown was that uh, TB-infected neutrophils do degrade type 1 collagen. Uh, within TB patients, MMP8 and 9 is increased in the induced sputum and are principally neutrophil-derived. Uh, the induced sputum from TB patients have increased type 1 collagen destruction uh, due to MMP8 activity, and MMP8 and 9 neutrophils are present in the pulmonary TB cavities. Uh, leading to the conclusion that neutrophils drive tissue destruction in human pulmonary TB. So um, I'm just going to show you just some preliminary data on how diabetes uh, worsen TB immunopathology. So DMTB does account for more than 10% of global TB deaths among HIV negative individuals. Our health minister, our previous health minister has declared a war on diabetes. Uh, and that was before, of course, COVID came along. Uh, and diabetic TB patients have uh, increased pulmonary cavities uh, with more neutrophilia actually compared to our non-diabetic TB patients. Uh, and we do know also diabetic TB patients are associated with higher risk of TB disease relapse, uh, as well as in about three to four fold increase in mortality. Uh, so one of my PhD students, uh, uh, Payman, she has a poster. Please do go and uh, have a look. Uh, she has an uh, uh, in vitro component uh, of her PhD work as well as a clinical component uh, from her uh, uh, 
from the lab point, the in vitro work, uh, she has recruited both healthy volunteer neutrophils as well as diabetic patients and neutrophils and, uh, and stimulated them with MTB, measuring proteases and cytokines, uh, reactive oxygen uh, species, as well as neutrophil extracellular traps. And these are our nets, uh, neutrophil uh, are extracellular uh, nuclear material that's thrown up from the neutrophils that try to phagocytose uh, uh, pathogens. Uh, what Payman had shown was that uh, uh, in diabetic patients, uh, their neutrophils actually produce much more reactive oxygen species compared to healthy controlled neutrophils. Uh, and also, uh, diabetic patients have decreased nets uh, compared to healthy controls, uh, uh, indicating that maybe diabetic patients may are less, uh, diabetic neutrophils are less capable of capturing pathogens uh, and perhaps even phagocytosing them. Uh, from her clinical cohort, she had, uh, up to this date, uh, recruited just an, uh, a slightly over 20 patients, comprising of nine diabetic TB patients and 13 TB patients. And interestingly, what, what she's shown was that the diabetic TB patients have increased in sputum IL-12, uh, increase in uh, IL-8, which is a neutrophil uh, chemoattractant, and the increase in sputum IL-8 actually strongly correlates with the HbA1c, which is an indicator of how well controlled the diabetes is. So the, the worse the, the diabetic control, the increase in a sputum IL-8. And this is perhaps the, one of the reasons why we are seeing uh, a worse immunophenotype in TB patients with diabetes. Uh, and more details are, are, can be found on her poster. So I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk about CNS-TB. And previously, we've, showed, uh, we've heard about how steroids uh, do improve uh, mortality. Um, so what happens in CNS-TB is that it does extensive brain inflammation and tissue destruction uh, as, as epitomized by the uh, granuloma formation uh, and, and cages necrosis within the brain parenchyma itself. Uh, and again, here we have a matrix degrading phenotype, uh, whereupon the activity of the MMPs are unopposed uh, to their tissue inhibitors or metalloproteinases. But this time around, we're looking at the blood brain barrier. Uh, so, there's breakdown of the blood brain barrier in CNS TB. Uh, this time around, we're looking at the type 4 collagen as well as the gelatin that underlines that blood brain barrier. Um, and strokes actually do occur in CNS TB. We have uh, those of us who have treated uh, CNS TB know that despite effective TB treatment, some of our patients unfortunately do develop strokes and recurrent strokes despite treatment. Uh, it can occur up to 45% of these patients, and unfortunately, is a marker of poor prognosis. Um, so the the process of thrombosis has not been exactly de clearly defined in CNS. -TB. TB, but the hypothesis that we are making uh, that neutrophil extracellular traps can be a cause of strokes. Um, and as mentioned before, these are extracellular DNA that's thrown from the nuclei from neutrophils to kill the bacteria, and they have been previously implicated in a whole spectrum of thrombotic diseases, including those associated with cancer and pulmonary embolism as well. Uh, so, of course, it, they have been produced when neutrophils encounter with MTB. And interestingly, uh, they are associated with matrix metalloproteinases as well. So within the blood-brain barrier, the two important um, uh, metalloproteinases, matrix metalloproteinases are MMP2 and 9, because these degrade the type 4 collagen, uh, which is a major component of the blood-brain barrier. So Xuanning, who had presented uh, her data yesterday evening, uh, have, uh, has, uh, has collected a cohort of uh, patients. Uh, these are pediatric uh, TB patients, uh, CNS-TB, uh, in collaboration uh, with Prof. Yotin Wern over at LKC Medicine. Um, and she also has created a preclinical model of uh, CNS-TB. Um, with a view to host directed therapy. Uh, this is some of her data. She's shown that uh, within the TBM patients, they have increased MMP2 as well as MMP9. Uh, and with MMP2 and 9 neutralizing antibodies within the CSF samples itself, the gelatinase activity actually significantly decreases. Uh, the CSF extracellular uh, DNA marker of NETS is increased in TB meningitis patients. 
uh, we've, she's also used citrullated H3 as another marker for NETS, and that's also significantly uh, increased in the TB meningitis patients. Uh, she then looked at uh, 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 radiological outcomes. These are looking at leptomeningeal enhancement uh, as well as uh, hydrocephalus. Uh, I'm not sure whether you could appreciate over uh, where you're sitting uh, or viewing from, but this is just an example of a child with normal CT brain, uh, and this is a child with uh, a hydrocephalus as well as leptomeningeal enhancement. Uh, and what she has shown um, was that in patients with uh, uh, leptomeningeal enhancement, the CSF MMPs are increased, uh, and in those with ventricular dilatation suggestive of uh, hydrocephalus, the MMPs are also increased. Uh, she then stratified the patients according to poor outcome defined by death or severe neurological deficits versus the good outcome with mild neurological deficits, uh, and also showed that uh, patients with with poor outcome tended to have higher CSF MMPs. Um, and she then further verified it in an animal model. Um, and this is by introducing live uh, MTB into the uh, ventricles of the patients by a very rather good technique. And you can Im uh, imagine this is one centimeter. She managed to inject um, uh, live MTB into the ventricles of these mice. Uh, and after uh, three weeks of infection, uh, harvested uh, the uh, various organs. You could see here, this is quite reminiscent of the typical granulomas that we see in CNS TB patients. Uh, and uh, these are positive for uh, acid fast bacilli. She showed that uh, the, um, the mice have increased in MMP2 and 9, uh, and we've then looked at uh, using an MMP2 uh, and 9 specific inhibitor called SB3CT. Uh, you could see in this pilot data of the mice, mouse model uh, that SB3CT itself uh, significantly improved the survival uh, compared to uh, the uh, infected mice alone. Um, MMP9 also is significantly decreased in the SB3CT plus anti-TB group compared to the infected mice alone. And uh, we're in the midst of uh, further increasing the sizes. Uh, and I can tell you right now that the SB3CT group in the, in the larger cohort of mice actually showed significantly improved survival compared to the NTTB group itself. So this is data that we are hoping to share in due course. I'm just going to now switch gears into translating our findings into human TB studies, and that's the role of host-directed therapy. Uh, Dr. Baichun, uh, who is our senior research fellow, has a poster on it, uh, so please do go and have a look. Uh, so we asked the question whether doxycycline could decrease TB tissue destruction. Uh, you, you might recall that uh, in one of the slides I showed you before that doxycycline could uh, significantly decrease the collagenase activity uh, in the neutrophils, which are infected with MTB. So we um, managed to carry out a phase two clinical trial uh, in pulmonary TB patients. Uh, and doxycycline, uh, as previously mentioned, is an MP inhibitor for gum disease. Uh, in other forms of lung diseases, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and asthma, it's been shown to improve uh, outcomes. Uh, and also, as an added uh, side point, it does uh, improve, uh, it is bacteriostatic. And one of my colleagues had previously shown uh, that MTB growth, uh, in terms measured by optical density, is decreased in the dose dependent concentration uh, with doxycycline itself. So we set out to do this phase two randomized placebo-controlled trial, looking at 30 pulmonary TB patients uh, and 10 uh, healthy volunteers itself. Uh, we randomized the patients into two arms, N equals to 15 in each arm, into doxy or placebo, and all of them received standard antitubercular treatment. Uh, the intervention was for a short two weeks that was based on a previous study that showed that MMPs decreased uh, uh, most rapidly within the first two weeks and therefore we decided just to give a short two weeks to determine how much um, 
uh, effect we could see and, and to also determine whether, uh, whether there are any other adverse effects that we should look out for. Uh, we looked at the chest X-ray um, and also collected induced sputum, blood and urine from these patients. Uh, and out of the 143 patients that were screened for eligibility, uh, we recruited um, uh, 30 and randomized 15 in each arm. Uh, and at the end of uh, the trial itself, we were uh, we managed to obtain 12 patients in each arm uh, to assess the blood and sputum samples. So in short, uh, within the system itself, uh, plasma MMP1 started to decrease at day 14, but interestingly, on, uh, met, managed to uh, meet statistical significance at day 56. So somehow there seemed to be a post-antibiotic effect itself. MMP8, as you could recall, might be uh, uh, might be neutrophil derived, nearly meets uh, statistical significance, uh, whereas the TIMPs themselves do not change with doxycycline intervention. Uh, the their effects within the respiratory compartment is more pronounced. We could see that there was statistically significant depression of the MMPs of MMP1, uh, 8, as well as 9 within the uh, sputum samples itself. And it translated to an increased uh, 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 effect in the collagenase activity with doxycycline inhibiting uh, type 1 collagenase activity and sputum elastase uh, full change. Uh, interesting, interestingly, we've also found that within the lung cavity volume itself, uh, at the end of two months, the ca lung cavities were significantly smaller in the doxycycline arm. Uh, so right now we're in the midst of trying to convince a funder to fund us for a phase three randomized control trial uh, with this uh, data and hopefully uh, would be able to move forward to improve patient outcomes. Uh, so in summary, um, what I've shared for you just this morning was that neutrophils drive TB inflammation in humans and the phenotype is worsened by in patients with uh, diabetes and TB co-infection. Uh, in CNS-TB, the upregulated MMPs are associated with worse outcomes, that's both in uh, radiological as well as neurological outcomes, uh, and an MMP inhibition, at least in our mouse model, may improve survival outcomes um, itself. Uh, and within uh, the phase two trial, doxycycline of two weeks could inhibit systemic and, res uh, systemic and respiratory MMPs. The effects, uh, interestingly, were observed six weeks post intervention uh, with uh, uh, an observed decrease in lung cavity volume. Uh, finally, just one more, one last plug, uh, our um, year three medical student, Yunting, also has a uh, poster. Uh, she is interested in ultra rapid point of care device for identification of pathogens and antimicrobial resi uh, resistant genes in bloodstream infection. She's looking to uh, work with our biomedical engineers to develop a point of care test comprising of uh, plasma separation, uh, lysis of the bacterial cells followed by ultra uh, uh, PCR, uh, hopefully all within the turnaround time of one hour. So just please um, have a look out of her poster. So of course, all these uh, would not have been possible without the work uh, of our lab members, as well as our alumni, uh, our co-investigators from NUHS, as well as the TV control unit, uh, Prof. Yong Sing Wen, um, as well as my previous uh, mentors, John Friedland, uh, our current co-investigators in the UK, Paul Arkington and Marta Polek, as well as the good people, including Prof. Lai uh, and SCR. And uh, and of course, lastly, our uh, gratitude to our funders. So thank you very much. Um, I'll be happy to take on any questions. Yeah.